equator wraps around the world like an emerald belt. In this almost undiscovered land, the jungles run deep and green, hiding more than we'll ever know. But there are also grasslands and islands, where nature's classic stories of life and death play out every day. This 24-hour journey along the equator will reveal that in the glare of the overhead sun, life is never easy, but is always wondrous. The equator is the Earth's midline, exactly halfway between the North and South Poles. The latitude of zero degrees. Of all the Earth, the equator receives more solar radiation than anywhere else, making it a rich and fertile region. In this equatorial journey, six of the world's most fascinating wildernesses will be revealed. It is 7 a.m. in equatorial Brazil. The awe-inspiring Amazon lies under the path of the sun. In March, much of the Amazonian jungle is in flood, creating a habitat dominated by water and tree canopy. Many of the terrestrial animals that live here have fled to higher ground leaving the aquatic animals to make the most of this flooded jungle. Many of them are giants. Capybara are the world's largest rodent. Looking like giant guinea pigs, they can weigh more than 75 kilograms. For them, the Amazon River is a source of food and a place to keep hidden and safe from predators. But this morning is no time for a swim because there is a convergence of killers taking place. This female green anaconda is one of the Amazon's largest hunters. At over five meters long, and weighing more than 100 kilograms, there's not a single native animal in the Amazon she cannot catch and eat. But this morning, she is not a hunter. She is the willing hunted. It is time for her to mate, and her scent is drawing in male anacondas. This male is only one-fifth of her weight, puny in comparison but he is slick and mobile and on an urgent mission to mate. The problem is, he's not the first suitor to arrive. Eight other anacondas are already wrapped around the female. A group of anacondas is called a knot. And this is why. Every male here has a pair of spurs for stimulating the female, tickling her into an arousal. The guys have to wrestle to win this serpentine battle for sex. They slip and slide past each other, jockeying for the best position at the heart of the knot. It's a death-defying love match, because the female at the center of this knot can come away from it with more than 80 fertilized eggs, and perhaps a belly full of male anaconda.
As the sun continues to rise, nighttime beetles scurry for cover. In the dark, they are relatively safe. But in the full light of day, beetles can be just morsels waiting to be caught. Any beetle unfortunate to lose its footing can be at grave risk. And not from drowning. Because these waters also hide giants. High above the Amazon, a harlequin beetle stridulates in warning. But it's a warning that goes unheeded. The Amazon's arowana fish are deadly predators below and above the waterline. They have evolved to hunt at the water's surface and beyond. They patrol the border of water and air, scanning the branches above for possible food. Even small birds can fall prey to more than a meter long arowana. When one of the world's richest ecosystems hangs above your head, just out of reach, it makes sense for a fish to evolve in a way to capture that bounty. Beyond the splashing of the arowana, most of the forest is still enjoying a peaceful rest. This is the sound of trees in fruit. Rubber trees are casting their seeds far and wide, more than 30 meters in a single pot. As the seed pods ripen, their surface skin shrivels, releasing the nuts. These hard nuts are well protected. But they are no match for one of the largest fish in the Amazon. The tambaki, a close relative of the piranha and a specialized seed eater. The tambaki's powerful jaws and teeth are perfect nutcrackers, and the fats and protein in a rubber seed can be a perfect meal, allowing the tambaki to grow to 30 kilograms. The Amazon at this time of year is a fish's paradise. It's as though the barriers between water and air no longer exist. For these splashing tetras, today is birthing day, and the birthing suite is far above them. A courting pair dart and move. They seem excited at what is to come. They are preparing for one of nature's most remarkable spawning achievements. The two fish suddenly leap high out of the water, where they cling to a hanging leaf. Until the female, and then the male, drop back into the river. They have left eggs behind on the leaf. They leap again, each time adding more eggs to the growing cluster. But the performance isn't over. The female swims away, 
and now the male must begin the job of preventing the eggs from drying out in the equatorial sun. For at least two days, this will be his contribution to the upbringing of his offspring. Until they begin to hatch and fall back into the mighty Amazon. As the sun continues to move across the Amazon, sunlight begins to strike to the west of Brazil. The next stop in this equatorial journey is the birthplace of the Amazon. The equator's Amazon River has many mothers, but all of its tributaries flow down from the giant green wall that is the Andes Mountains. The equator intersects with the Andes in the nation of Ecuador. It is mid-morning, and in the high mountains, the day is only just beginning to warm. This valley is home to a female spectacled bear. Spectacled bears are named for the markings on their faces. She has a mask as unique as a fingerprint. Her cub is nearly a year old. He will soon be independent, but for now, he's his mother's pupil. Each morning, they trek through the damp Andean cloud forest in search of one of their preferred meals. Bromeliad plants are the green water pitchers of the South American jungles. These relatives of the pineapple form a vase shape as they grow that captures water, which many animals take advantage of. Many bromeliads grow high up in the trees to catch as much sun as possible. So that's where the bears must go. Spectacled bears are South America's only species of bear and are often considered the best climbers in all the bear world. The cub is determined to join his mother. But although he has the will, he is not yet capable. Instead, his mother knocks bromeliad after bromeliad to the ground for him. Spectacled bears are mostly plant eaters, but birds, small mammals, and insects are also on the menu. The mother bear leaves a trail of destruction as she feeds. The cub is a fast learner. On his second climbing attempt, he makes much better progress. Not all of Ecuador is wet and green. On the slopes of the Cayambe volcano, conditions can be cool and the land dominated by grasses. At more than 5,700 meters, Cayambe is the highest point on the equator and is one of the only spots on the equator with snow cover. It's warmer now, but last night temperatures dropped to minus six degrees. 
If this baby Vicuña had been born then, he could have frozen to death. But female Vicuñas almost always give birth during the day to give their offspring the best chance of survival. Here in Ecuador, Vicuñas are introduced animals with a natural range far to the south. But with superb adaptations to living at altitude, they are right at home here under the equator. The dominant male who watches over his big herd of females and their young is alert for intruders. Because females mate soon after giving birth, birthing season collides with mating season here in the Andes, and bachelor males are drawn in to try their luck. And when a male chases other males away from his herd, what begins as a sprint can turn into a marathon. The pair begin to squabble, and their mood proves contagious. Fights begin to break out in the herd as males square off. All these males aspire to lead a herd, but few of them will ever succeed. One of the ways to gain leadership is to fight the dominant male, and frequent practice is the best way to refine their fighting skills. The sparring partners bite and kick and attempt to bring their opponent to his knees. Size, strength, skill, all factors which will determine the winner. The Ark of the Sun will not wait for the Vicuña to settle their rivalry. It moves on, traveling west at just over 1,600 kilometers per hour to shine down upon the legendary Galapagos Islands. The 19 main islands of the Galapagos straddle the equator, approximately 1,000 kilometers west of Ecuador. It is late morning, and the temperature here is still only in the mid-twenties, because the Galapagos are forever cooled by the cold ocean currents flowing up the west coast of South America. The day is hours old before the Galapagos marine iguanas have warmed enough that they can begin their day. As cold-blooded reptiles, it takes the heat of the sun before they are roused into life after a cool night. Big male iguanas make their way down to the water's edge. They face an unusual challenge. Not far offshore, there are beds of seaweed growing that the iguanas graze on. But the water is cold, and any energy they have gained from the sun is going to be quickly lost as they make their way to their morning meal. 
Only the largest males have enough body mass to survive the chill waters. Iguanas are voracious eaters. They clip the weed until it looks like a newly mown lawn. But it replaces itself quickly in these rich waters. The smaller and younger iguanas cannot make this journey. They will grow cold too quickly. So their only chance to feed is when low tide comes, uncovering the weed beds. The big males will return to the shore for this easy meal, but by now they are chilled. As a reptile cools, its strength ebbs. So for these big male iguanas, fighting their way back to shore is a perilous mission, but one they face every day. around the Galapagos may be cold, but it is also rich with life. Blue-footed boobies are diving for food, not far from the iguanas. But their feet aren't blue due to the cold. For these boobies, having blue feet is how you attract a mate. Better if you can dance while you show off your blue suede shoes. About half of the world's breeding blue-footed boobies live in the Galapagos. These birds are mostly monogamous and can breed whenever the conditions are right for them. So courtship displays can happen alongside boobies that are already bringing up their young. Booby chicks are fully dependent on their two parents for food and protection for almost six months. And these parents are going to be particularly busy because they have to fight off regular assaults from piratical frigate birds. Magnificent frigate birds are very strong flyers and good at fishing. But they are also kleptoparasites that will make a living by thieving from other birds. A red-footed booby collecting sticks to build a nest has to run a gauntlet of aerial pirates. Sticks for nest building are hot property in this part of town. A dropped stick is an easy pickup for an agile frigate bird. Even other frigate birds are fair targets for these bandits. Competition for resources is so intense that frigate birds always have to be on guard, even at the nest. In the 
seas below the frigate bird's fortress is a bird that is the polar opposite. It can't fly at all, at least not through the air. The little Galapagos penguin lives far from what would be considered the natural home for a penguin. It is the only penguin to venture across the equator into the northern hemisphere. But with the smallest population of any penguin, numbering as few as 1,000 breeding individuals, this is one bird that is barely tolerating life at the equator. From flooded jungle to cold mountain tops and desert-like islands, the equator's track across the New World is one of extreme landscapes and animals. But half a planet away lies the Old World, where ancient forests grow and animals live out a timeless battle for survival. Next stop along the equator, Borneo, the third largest island on Earth, and its sister island, the jungle-clad Sumatra. The sun has already made its 12 p.m. zenith and is now working its way back toward the horizon. Orangutans pole vault their way across the forest, using their immense weight and the flexibility of the jungle saplings. An adult male can weigh almost 70 kilograms. The young trees sag beneath their weight. A prodigious memory helps them navigate huge distances in search of fruits. The local gibbons are also cutting a beeline for their favorite fruiting tree. They are able to cover almost three meters in a single swing, and more when they throw caution and themselves to the wind. Crab-eating macaques are spending their time along a stream edge, where there are plenty of places to avoid the afternoon heat. While the elders cool off and fish for crabs and tasty frogs, the youngsters splash and play. But their antics have been noticed. A Sumatran tiger, the smallest of the tiger species, has detected the sounds of monkeys wafting down the river. To catch a fleet-footed monkey, stealth is key. But the tiger's almost silent approach has been uncovered by the crab eaters, and it has lost the element of surprise. Up above, Leaf monkeys are on the move. Late in the day, they like to gorge on leaves and grass, 
which they will slowly digest overnight. While they may split up and travel separate paths during the day, after their last feed, most of the troop will roost as a group in a single tree. The Sumatran tiger has been waiting for the afternoon light. When shadows grow long, it is a good time to hunt. The leaf monkeys are sharing this thicket with 30 centimeter tall mouse deer. The tiny deer remain extremely alert and will warn of a threat by stamping the ground. Unlike the monkeys, they can't escape up the nearest tree. But today, it's a leaf monkey that loses the race, paying the price and feeding the queen of this jungle. While the light in the jungle understory is dwindling, on the coast, it is still strong. Mangrove estuary, in which ocean and dry land gently merge together, creates a rich habitat occupied by creatures from both realms. Saltwater crocodiles are the ancient rulers of the mangroves. Long ago, they adapted to hunt the fertile waters between land and sea. This female is raising her young in this sheltered estuary. They're confident enough to venture freely among the mangrove roots. They may not have eaten since hatching, but when they're hungry, they'll hunt for their first meal here. Their mother's lurking not far away, discreetly watching for both intruders and prey. The mangrove's fringing trees are a common evening roost for Borneo's proboscis monkey. Many other monkeys visit Borneo's mangroves, but few depend on them as much as the proboscis. A senior male is anxious. Some of his charges are skirting close to the dangerous water, and he has seen the mother croc. His alarm call alerts the troop. And the panic drops one monkey right into the jaws of danger. But the crocodile has missed her opportunity. Crocodiles are patient hunters, so she will be sure to keep an eye open for the next monkey's mistake. Mother Crocodile's display of hunting skills has lit a predatory flame in her offspring. With small crabs roaming the estuary mudflats, this afternoon is a great time for them to graduate from infant to killer. Fiddler crabs pack their lives into low tide. The females feed at a frantic speed. Hungry males may be hampered from feeding as quickly by their super claw. But it may save them today as sibling saltwater crocodiles fan out on the mud 
in search of a meal. They're still supervised by a watchful mother. As they venture from the water, the young crocs are feeling hunger for the first time, and the mud is crawling with potential meals. First, the youngster stalks. Then, once in a good strike position, it freezes and pounces. The head shake to tear the prey apart is all croc instinct. One day, he'll do it to pigs and monkeys. As the sun reaches for the horizon in Borneo, it is still shining hot and strong at the equator's next landfall, in Kenya. In March in Kenya, the equatorial sun is as much a deadly enemy as the heavy hunters that stalk the savannah. Kenya's arid savannah is a rare landscape at the equator. Here on the northern savannah, the rains are almost due. A hot, dry wind, known as the Kaskazi, has been blowing down from the Persian Gulf, parching the land, and now, just before the day ends, conditions are at their toughest. Vultures ride the powerful heat waves using their keen eyesight to locate the victims of the drought. In the dry season, survival is all that matters. Lions have remained on the savannah throughout. Hunger is a constant companion for them. They have had too much time gazing out on depleted hunting grounds. This Thompson's gazelle will not satisfy their needs, but it will help. Lions have evolved as large-bodied brawlers. They can be fast off the blocks, but need a quick hit and will tire in an extended chase. Each unsuccessful hunt saps energy, especially for females with young. The pursuit ends in failure. Kenya's cheetahs are much better designed to take advantage of the open savanna. Out here, there's often nowhere to hide, so the cheetah relies on speed more than stealth. While adult females will live alone when they are not mothering cubs, Male cheetahs form groups known as coalitions, often composed of brothers. They will live and hunt together as a team for the rest of their lives. Weighing more than 65 kilograms, cheetahs are the lithe, fast attack model in the world of big cats. Small ungulates like gazelle are prime targets for them. If the cheetah can begin its chase before the prey sees it, the cat has the upper hand. It can rev up to top speed inside of three seconds, putting the prey well behind in the race to live another day. To reach its maximum speed of over 100 kilometers per hour, 
Weight for weight, a cheetah unleashes four times more energy than a racehorse. The brothers are working to cut a young Thompson's gazelle out from the herd. It has little chance of survival with three hunting cheetah on its tail. An adult cheetah may eat three and a half kilos of meat per day. So this young gazelle, shared among three cats, is probably not going to be the only prey they chase today. The lions are not as lucky. Much of their usual prey has abandoned this savanna during the drought. But the lions must stay here to protect their territory and go hungry. In the dry season, cubs may starve to death. But there is more than one way for them to die. Hyenas are also desperately hungry, and they are cub killers. Lions are always dangerous foes, but hungry and desperate lions defending their young. Lone hyenas are wise to keep well away. <laughs> On the equator in March, sunset comes just before 7 p.m. It is the moment when one world gives way to another. The peaceful grazers that have made the most of good fields of view throughout the day now face a long night of fear and danger. Because the big predators that have been unable to stalk prey during the daylight are now waiting. Darkness is no hindrance if you're equipped with night vision. The starving lion pride becomes highly organized when it is time to hunt. Once a group of prey animals is identified, they are slowly and quietly surrounded. When all of the hunters are in position, one or two lions make themselves visible. The gazelles move quickly away, but the trap is set. The kill is shared among the hungry members of the pride. They eat quickly while the big male of the pride is busy marking his territory. It can extend over 250 square kilometers. As he patrols, he leaves scent marks along the borders. He is concerned with other male lions, but there is a greater threat. His females are being surrounded by a band of hyenas. The lions have brought down a buffalo. The hyena pack is pressing forward on them, menacingly. The females have no choice but to give up their hard-won meal. But now, the master of the pride returns. The hyena's dominance is short-lived. Superior numbers are no match for an angry male lion. Oh, <laughs> 
The price of his protection is that he can take over the kill. The last place the sunlight reaches in this 24-hour journey along the equator is Gabon on Africa's west coast. These hippos may look just the same as others, but their behavior is very different. They are drawn to the sea for reasons that remain a mystery. Many animals come to the shore for many reasons. The forest buffalo come here for food. Vegetation that is flushed out of the forest on rivers is washed back on shore. Mangrove seed pods are delicacies which contain high concentrations of nutrients that animals need. Elephants also know of this special food source, and they pass this knowledge on to their young. But the hippos in Gabon go further than the sand. They take to the waves. They seem to come to remind us that as much as we know about the natural world, we still know very little. We can measure the equator and the land beneath it and document the facts about the animals. But here, on the beaches of Gabon at dawn, a mother hippo and her baby come down to the shore, reminding us that nature is full of wonder. And it cannot be easily measured like the hours of a clock. <laughs> 